animators and artists. David Levy is the author of many best-selling books in the animation industry, including Your Career in Animation, How to Survive and Thrive. David is the Chief Creative Officer of Invisible Universe, an internet-first animation studio. He's lectured and taught at animation schools around the US and was president of the New York chapter of ASIFA. David Levy joins our stream to discuss your career in animation, as well as your career in animation. David, welcome to the stream. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Toon Boom, for having me. It's it's a delight to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, David, how would you describe your current roles and responsibilities as a chief creative officer at a studio? And what does a typical day look like? Oh, gosh. Yeah, so there's a lot of irons in the fire, lines in the water, plates being spun on each finger, um, which is really exciting. And so, yeah, we're an internet first, um, you know, tech entertainment studio, and we're all about creating the next uh, big enter entertainment animation franchises, um, starting on social as our incubation point. And, and what's so cool about that is we're doing it in public development with our audience, um, building the plane as we're flying it in public <laughs> on, on each of these characters. Um, so you get a lot of feedback, you get a lot of data, you get you, you you see who your audience is you know it's really invaluable and um you get to pivot all the time and try things and experiment um so any given day i'm brainstorming new content with with the team you know for our next social posts i'm reviewing content and production that's about to go live you know and um have have some great creative directors we're working with um that you know really can run their lane and that i, I do my best to support and stay out of their way and um, we're always looking at how the content is doing. We have a weekly summary of you know all our all our IP and how it's performing in social. So there's there's always that, and we make decisions with based on that. Um, and we're always working with um, on our on our off platform strategy because the point is to grow franchises. So we're we're planning based on a different time clock um, per per character IP. When 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 a character is ready to go to long form, you know, with a streaming partner, or when there, when there might be a publishing opportunity, or you know, or or possibly something, you know, in the NFT space with with uh, Web three, um, so there's you know unique things that get unlocked as we get successful, you know, and that that affects the day to day. Of course, um, I'm always meeting with with new talent, um, and and a lot of times that just means talent I haven't come across yet. You know, great writers, great designers, great animators around the world because I never know what my needs are tomorrow. So you know, I really try to cast a wide net and, uh, work, and I'm working closely all the, every day with uh, my CEO and COO on our day-to-day -day short and long-term strategy um, based, on, based on all these equations that are going. And um, in addition to that, collaborating daily with our, our uh, virtual studio based in Brazil, uh, where we've got a great animation team um, that's, you know, responding you know with with animation all through the day in different stages that, that need needs attention so it's it's very much a lot of switching gears it's a lot of okay you know making my morning checklist of what my urgent priorities are for the day and checking them off as i go and then and also knowing the next morning what i need to hit first that's my typical day i think it's really cool that you have an opportunity to do development work in public um because <laughs> i think a lot of audiences uh, for what we usually cover is like production, pre-production, where a lot of audiences don't get to see that. But then to go even one step further back and talk about uh, how the uh, TV show uh, is going to, um, I guess, the process of what it will eventually become and look like uh, is something mm -hmm. that uh, audiences don't usually get a chance to see. Absolutely. And, and for us, sometimes it just means we've launched characters that don't have a voice yet. Like we literally didn't, you know, it wasn't plan A to either identify a voice for the character to have a speaking voice or uh, the process by which the casting of that voice just took longer than expected. Um, and, and, and those characters are live and performing without it for the time being, you know, through any number of ways. And um, that's an interesting thing that's so different than traditional animation platforms like on, on long form, for instance, like you wouldn't, be, be in season two or three and think, oh, we really got to get the casting. We just can't commit to who's going to be the voice. Like that would be really unusual to have like gotten that far. But but to us, that's kind of a normal thing. 
Yeah, I, I think that's fascinating. So the reason why we invited you onto the stream is to talk about your book, your career in animation. And uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book is you spend a significant amount of time talking about uh, your early career experiences as well as those of your colleagues. And uh, I really wanted to ask you, how often do you think about your early career experiences when you're hiring and working with new talent? I, I do. And I think it's important to remember like when you were starting out and full of all the unknowns about what your future would be, where your first break might be, what what you even could do, you know, on your first job. Like that's a, that's a lot, you know, that's going through someone's mind as they're applying for things or doing interviews. So I really feel like you should never, no matter how where you go and where what phase of career you're at, you can't forget forget that where you where you come from, and that responsibility of being able to look at new talent that didn't necessarily do the exact thing you need them to do, like don't have it on their resume that they've been, you know, an animator on a 2D preschool show before, you know, for um, with, you know, four, four legged characters like you need them to animate now. But, you know, but they might have a reel that that had a student film where they did that beautifully or they might have great designs where that's how they like to draw naturally or, you know, there's so many other things to look at that that can make up who that person is and the sum of their experiences. So I think I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind, especially as we're trying to build more diverse, more inclusive workplaces. Um, when you do that, you're opening to a, a much wider community of candidates that that didn't get in the kingdom yet or aren't the most intuitive choices. So I, I really try as a hiring manager to live by that. David, for people who haven't picked up the book yet, and you definitely should, uh, what is your career in animation and who is the book for? Well, you know, the I think at a glance, it could be easy to, to think it's for the newcomer, the student, the about to graduate um, animation artist. It's absolutely for them, but it's it's not exclusively for them. It's it's also for, for folks like me that are, you know, deep in their careers. I'm not going to say how deep, um, but where we're, we're basically, you know, on different, you know, have different choices to make, have different... Uh, opportunities, you know, based on, you know, our careers to this point. And um, I didn't want, you know, that group, which is, you know, a very important part of the industry too, to be, to, to be underserved in a book like this. So that, that then it, be, it was up to me to make sure through the interview process, through collecting all the stories that there's people at all different walks of, of different stages of career. So you have people who are in supervising roles that have done that for 30 years or in the book. There's people who have been recruiting for you know 10 years there's there's you know animators that are two years into their careers designers you know 15 or art directors and, and everyone's at a different point and you can research them and learn more about them you know on their own social handles and stuff i encourage you know readers to do that so you're getting a wide range of perspectives because you know i certainly wouldn't want it to only be my point of view from my career to date so that that helped i think get a much wider snapshot of, of the industry today to, to approach it that way. What led you to writing this book and what was that process like? <laughs> well, the, I have to go back to the first edition, which um, I started writing in 2004. And, and that's kind of a fun story too, because it's really a career story in, in and of itself. I was teaching or I just gotten the opportunity to teach at the School of Visual Arts uh, for a 15 week class uh, for seniors. It was the class they get at the end of their four years at SVA that teaches them how to get a job in the industry, hopefully. It's called career strategy or something like that for animators. And I got I got the opportunity to teach it. And it was one of my favorite classes as a student. So I, really, I was excited about that. And the first thing you get to do as an adjunct professor is write the syllabus, right? You always throw away the previous syllabus. You're like, ah, they didn't know what they were doing. And then you start over, or at least you, you look at what they did and you try to improve it. So I made my 15 week lecture topics and I, and I kind of thought, oh, this is a chapter list too. This feels like a book. Why don't we have this book? And, and it was like a eureka moment. And I had already um, gotten involved with uh, a publisher in New York because I was as president of ASIFA, the ASIFA chapter of, of, of New York, ASIFA East. I, I had promoted a few books that were printed locally, you know, just down the block by a, a small press. So I, I took their publicist to lunch with what I what I wrote up as a chapter list and a, a little 
letter, you know, kind of a cover letter. And, and she said, wow, I think we're going to want this book, you know, because it felt like something they would print. And um, they had done a lot of like art industry books, you know, so I did get a response, you know, the publisher called me up and said, okay, you're, this is great, but what, you know, we need to see a sample chapter. So I just wrote up a sample chapter, you know, for spec, did it in a couple of weeks, sent it in and they, and, and then he had a few, this was the best part because I got an email back that said, had three questions. It says, well, how many pages will it be? Are you willing to change the title and how long will it take you to write? When I read that email, I literally turned white because I thought they bought this book. Like you, you did not ask those three questions if you don't want the book, you know? So I answered the questions and then I got an email back, check your fax machine. That's how old the story is. Um, your, your, your book contract is in the fax, please sign and return. And I was like, you know, then it was like, oh my gosh, we got to do this. But, but that, that was how it happened. And that's, I'm, I'm telling you that long story because that's how I approach career anyway. You know, like it's about making those connections. Like nothing happens in a, in a vacuum, like, the opportunity to teach this class was amazing. And I, I really believed in that, that mission with those students that I would have every year. But there's also a bigger thing to do with this to, to reach a larger swath of, of you know, North America. And, and why not connect that with, with the larger story? So like, you know, I, I love to kind of, I guess it's like an entrepreneurial thing. And I, I feel like that to me, that represents like the hustle that's the hustle that that I found really helpful in my career in animation, that you 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 make your own opportunities, you make your own luck, you make your own connections. Yeah, that makes sense, because like the animation industry is very much a uh, instead of you have one career at a studio forever, it's very often uh, production to production. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're you, you know, you, that sounds very destabilizing and it sounds really chaotic. But when you look back, if you take a step back, and you realize you are the consistency in that story. You are the one on this journey. Then it's like, oh, like, and if you look backwards and you go, okay, so I was here for three years and I, I did that. And then I, oh, that led to this next opportunity. There's actually an order to it when you turn around. It doesn't necessarily always feel that way, but um, it's it's very much there, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you take those moments to kind of appreciate it. <laughs> So uh, as you mentioned, the, the first book came out in 2004. That was like three years before the iPhone. That was when Netflix was still mailing people DVDs. Yeah. Uh, so how has the animation industry changed since the first and second editions of your book? Gosh, yeah. Well, the first one of the first opportunities I, I was really grateful to have was to try again, you know, to, to show that change, like what, what has changed. And some of the stuff is embarrassing what what had to take so long to happen, like Me Too movement, diversity and inclusion initiatives, like th those were not top of mind as they should have always been. Um, but we're we're all you know, we all know we've all gotten the message. I hope at this point, and it's all our our collective responsibility to um, you know build build that better, more diverse industry um, every single day. So I wanted to make sure that as I did another set of a hundred interviews for the new book. That, that that was the mission. Like who's, what are the most diverse, amazing people I can find from all walks of life and backgrounds that are working in animation, not like the people I, I happen to have coffee with and are already working with. So that was a, a tremendous opportunity. And, um, but other changes like streaming platforms and the fact that there's all these niche audiences that, that didn't, you know, have shows, you know, served to them before. And, and that there's season arcs because of the way the content is distributed on platforms where you, you might binge watch it. So you can have episodes that connect and, and, and are going to be played in a certain order that's intuitive to that story. That was never part of the average animation series proposal, you know, and now it's an expected one um, for, for certain audience ages. So, you know, it, that's such a, a cool thing. And then the taboo that used to be around like self-publishing you know, it, it used to feel like a stigma. Oh, I self-published. I tried to get it printed, but with a publisher, but I, I went the self-publishing route. There's, no, you know, now self-publishing means self-distribution on Instagram. You know, like think of all the great comic artists and, and um, cartoonists and, and illustrators and designers that, that and animators that are publishing content themselves, distributing content. So they're, they're incubating, you know, their brand, their, their stories, their storytelling um, without any gatekeepers, without anyone to say no. And and with and with with a huge reach, you know, and and platforms and the traditional world are are watching and and learning from that and and trying to pull those people, you know, into the mainstream. 
so you know i i really think it's an exciting it was an exciting time to kind of refresh the book yeah well i, I think what's really exciting is that with platforms like youtube uh people are able to self publish uh animated <laughs> series uh mm -hmm. which is uh wild in so many ways but to, to see the success of uh lackadaisy and has been hotel ha hell of a boss ollie and scoops um yeah. i think it's really encouraging for a lot of artists absolutely yeah and it's it's just it shows there's another way to develop content where the artist the writer the creator you know can 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 you know make just just by creating work by finding the audience for it by by improving in public it's it's really you know it's it's an opportunity that was never there you know like i feel like the, the closest analog to it was the independent film uh, world the spike and mike days and film festivals where you could you could have mike judge get discovered with beavis and butthead you know something he made in his basement or i mean the garage as a as an outsider animator so now, now it's it's so it's it's so much more inclusive and 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 accessible to to so many more people. Yeah, I also just think that the the scope of what has been published so far on streaming services, um, now that you don't need to have uh, eleven or twenty two minutes, uh, mm. you know, the, the, those ad supported formats. Um, I, I think it's really interesting to see what that's turned into. And I'm really curious to see where that goes in the next five years. Oh, yeah. And I think it's one of the first things that's fun, like whenever there's a new drop of the Stranger Things, even like things that aren't animated. Like, I feel like everyone does this. Like when, when you see the whole season dump and you look, oh, you, how many episodes are there going to be? And you start feeling, okay, I want to know when I'm in the middle and I want to know when I'm getting near the end. And you don't want to read any of the titles because it's going to give something away. But, you know, that sense of, I don't know how many episodes are in a season. I don't know how long each episode is. And, and there's no one knows until the story tells that team, those creators, what it is. You know, I think that's a really exciting thing. Yeah. So uh, throughout the book, you mention instructors, mentors, and peers who helped you throughout your career. Um, would you like to briefly mention some of the artists who had an influence on you and why it's important to develop professional relationships in the animation industry? Yeah, I, I would. Um, you know, for me, it's funny because a lot of times when people hear my list or if I say Linda Semensky has been a mentor to me since college, she never signed a paper to be my mentor. There was no contract. You know, like I know there's a lot of official mentoring and mentees, you know, that happened through corporate, you know, pairings. You know, there was a thing at Disney when I was there where I was on both sides of that. Um, the, a lot of those things can be official arrangements. But for me, the, they've always been unofficial and casual. And, and, and I've gotten, I don't even know if the other person knew <laughs> you know, they were my mentor. And that's probably how it should be, you know, because I was just learning from them and, and, and uh, wanting, wanting to pick their brain and, and hear, hear how, they, how they did things. And, and really, it came down to being friends, you know, is what it always was. Um, and my first one was Howard Beckerman, who just turned 90 this year. He's from Terry Toons originally, um, Heckle and Jekyll and, and all those great things. He was, he was my favorite teacher at the School of Visual Arts. And although I was not at all someone who could, you know, draw rings around anybody or, or was the class, you know, talent or anything like that, he um, took me under his wing and saw I had ideas and, and encouraged me as a storyteller and, and took me really seriously. And I, and I, and I, I my self-esteem was like nothing, you know, at the time. And for him to have like noticed the one thing I, I had an aptitude for, which I didn't even know it was true. Uh, really just gave me just a huge boost, you know, in emotionally and, you know, my confidence like that I, I, that there would be a place for me somewhere, somehow, you know, that, that was, you know, incredible. And then the same thing happened um, at, at Michael Sporn studio, my first employer, you know, where he, you know, through, through his trust in me to be like a studio assistant to pay, like a paid apprenticeship, he, um, you know, let me help on, on, every area of production and that's kind of, was kind of his way but uh, you know i really got to try every chair you know in the studio and um i i got to see through him the the culture that he that he founded you know which is something i always have to spotlight when i'm asked this question like most studios you know like when i worked at nickelodeon as my next job after his, after his studio when someone was stuck with a long scene, you'd, you know, you'd say good night to them. And if they were having a challenge, you go, all right, good night, good night, Dan. Oh, you know, I oh, hope you don't have to stay too late. And you leave and poor Dan is still there. 
and he's animating on his scene and maybe he stayed till midnight that night that that's the way it is like a lot of times but at michael Sporn studio when you had a stack of things let's say we were all um doing storyboards or layouts or cell painting whatever it was if you saw the other person's stack was thicker than yours and you were done and it was like an hour left of the day you would say give me some of that and you would take take some of their work and you would help them finish and then everyone left the studio at six o'clock and, and we all sometimes went and had a beer, you know, in the corner. And it was like this feeling of, wow, this is a team sport and, and all the possible and all the ways possible. And, you know, and that's that was a pretty magical thing to see and that it can be like that. Um, so that that's something I certainly learned from him. And then Linda Semensky, you know, and just in terms of her, you know, being so public with and being on the forefront of development at, at Nickelodeon when it became the creator driven era through uh, doing that for the next phase of Cartoon Network and then taking that to PBS Kids and boosting that for, for the youngest audience and now going to Duolingo. Like she she's someone who loves to be there for the formative years. She's a person who who's a builder, you know, and so she's identified that part of herself. And, and when I look at that and I think, wow, that's kind of what I love, too. And she had to kind of say it before I even understood that about myself, that that was a motivator for me. Like it's it's so much more exciting to be the underdog, to be aiming for the target than to just be on the winning team and just show up and, and everything's great. Like those those are just a few a few of the, my mentors. And um, I do think people, you, you know, looking for mentors, you should remember, keep it casual. And, and it doesn't have to be this official, awkward process. And, and you don't have to take everything about the person and as as this golden ticket like you know pull out the pieces that apply to you and, and what you're looking to do and learn from those pieces because no no one is a complete clone of, of where you're headed yeah i think it's really interesting too when speaking with artists in the industry how many people have stories about uh this one instructor who noticed one thing about their work and that <laughs> sort of defined the rest of their entire career like oh i can do this yeah. Um, and for them, maybe it was just a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they probably didn't feel the same way on both sides, but I think that's all right. Yeah, I think that's just the, the nature of the power structure in those moments. I wanted to ask, uh, what might students and aspiring artists not know about applying for jobs in the animation industry from the outside? Oh my gosh. I, and unfortunately, this is something even those who have worked already need to hear sometimes. So I, I'll give you a story. Um, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. I had a, a, a former student who's a, a great storyboard artist and she had storyboarded on a few shows and then she took some time off uh, to be a parent. And then she was coming back into the industry and boy, she should be hired in two seconds. Um, but she had some trouble. So she sent me, I, I asked her, okay, send me your cover letter. What, it, what does it look like? Let me see how you're applying to stuff. So she was applying to storyboard positions. So she sent me the cover letter and she listed herself as a 2D animator, um, and then it said, like, if you if you read down to like paragraph four on the cover letter, it says, I, I do storyboards, too. And I, and I was like, wait a minute, you're applying to storyboard jobs. So you, you've made it now really hard for the recruiter, the hiring manager, whoever, human resources, whoever's looking at this. They're immediately not making that connection that you're applying for the right job. So it's already a broken equation. Right. So she wasn't getting callbacks. She wasn't getting the interviews she deserved. So, you know, I think the, that's pretty much my advice based on a story like that is, is to be, help them make those connections. Don't make them do extra work, do extra reading, do extra research on you. Apply for the things that, that, that you're qualified to do, that you're passionate to do and have done or, want, or you know, are leading to do and, and make it as clear as possible that that's who you are, you know, for that application. You know, you might, might be good at five things, but like for that application, you gotta be really specific yeah, I, I think so. When we had our uh, recruiter panel uh, last month, um, Allison Mann, I think, said uh, that you want to make sure that uh, your portfolio makes it really easy for you to get hired in, in your cover letter, mm -hmm. uh, resume, all of it, um, because there's probably one person sifting through thousands of uh, applications. And if yours is very clear and uh, makes a good case for why you should be hired, that can only help. <laughs> Definitely. And it's not a one size fits all resume. It's not a one size fits all cover letter. Like you, you have your base, your template, but with each opportunity you apply for, customize it, make it more relevant to the job you're applying for. And um, 
And don't my other uh, the other piece of advice I want to add to your question is don't apply like a shotgun like you know just like to everything you're 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 seeing because you're those are the same people getting all the applications at the at, at in these positions and they're going to see oh you applied to eight things and even if you had eight specific cover letters and eight specific resumes you know that's still going to look really strange and and show that you don't really know who you are or what you want and you're not it's not a very desirable position to be in. Um, so, you know, be, be mindful, like really apply to the things that are worth applying for. And then especially when you think about what if you have a reference, you know, someone at the studio, you, you're not going to go to that person eight times, you know, for eight references, you got to really be careful about that, right? That reference is precious on both sides. So you got to really think about that. And then like when it's the right one and it's the important one, that's where you use that reference nickel because you don't want to spread that thin either. Yeah, so uh, I think that can also be really challenging for uh, students uh, who are just graduating and want their first job and they don't know yet what they want to specialize in. Uh, I, I think that can make it really tricky when they see all of these different uh -huh. openings at a studio and thinking, okay, well, which one's right for me? Yeah, but you bring up a great point. There's two paths. There's You could basically distill an animation career into two paths. There's the generalist or the specialist. The generalist is like what I described at my Michael Sporn studio, my first job, where like I was expected to be able to help in any area where they needed the help that day, that week, whatever. So that meant backgrounds, animation, layouts, in betweening, and you know, writing, anything. Um, and then, but but more jobs are like the big studios because the bigger the bigger the project, whether it's a series or a feature, the more um, compartmentalized the roles are. So you're you're going to be expected to be a specialist on those crews. So, you know, but if you're a generalist at heart and you never think you're going to be the specialist who should who would work on those productions, then then there's there's great generalist paths like at, at smaller studios where those that diverse skill set is an amazing asset. One of the things I really enjoyed about the book is that you have uh, an outline of all of these different career paths that you can take. And you also include like recommended readings for if, if you're really interested in um, becoming a storyboard artist, here's what you should read, um, mm. which I think is, is a very uh, interesting and generous way to approach that. Mm -hmm. um, just, just briefly, what are some of the career paths that you mentioned in the book and why might students and early career artists not be aware of these roles in the industry? Yeah, I think, well, you know, here's a, an example. So if you look at Logan Houdini Clark and Ross Bollinger, who are both in the book in the kind of the indie section, they're both YouTube um, creators and they both have huge followings on YouTube and they both employ a crew of people to help them create their content. And they have, you know, staff, you know, to do so. Um, they're, they're really, they're making their living, a good living doing, you know, as an independent uh, you know, animation studio using YouTube as distribution. So they, neither of, of them set out to do that because they, that's not the path that they imagined for themselves, you know, as a typical student, um, some, you know, 12 years ago when they graduated. So I think they kind of looked at it as, well, I can't get a job or I can't get the position I want. Like I'm, I'm not going to get a job on SpongeBob at the time, or I'm just not a fit, you know, for these things. And then they, 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 found success somewhere else. And I think it almost felt like a plan B success, but I think what they've come to understand is this is an amazing lane and it's not second place. It's really a fantastic fit. And, and that's the whole point of a career. If it was as straightforward as I wanted this and I got that and the end, you know, like we wouldn't be talking at all, right? Like it would be just be so clear and, and cut and dry. So I love, I love that. Like, they, that they were open to a different kind of success than they imagined was even available in the industry. So I think that's one one way to look at it. Um, the other thing that's so funny is, you know, because I had, when I was writing this updated edition, I was heading um, animation for socials at Disney Plus, you know, for, for um, and the, the main accounts were Walt Disney Animation Studios, Pixar, and Lucasfilm. So we were doing original content for all three, which was really exciting. But we were never... Um, like that, I had a team of eight, eight great folks, you know, producers and animators in house, all working with me at Disney in like a little boutique shop, like this tiny little blip on the mothership. 
and uh, we were never, you know, that's that's never on the map for anyone at Cal Arts. They don't talk about that as a like, oh, there's a team that does this kind of thing, or you know, like you're, there's. But but a lot of studios like DreamWorks Animation has a, an in-house team, maybe a little bigger than that, where I have a friend who's an animator, and the, where they're animating title sequences for shows, doing fixes for you know revision passes on things, special promos that are, are you know all really cool stuff and all different techniques and and with great. Um, artistry and like that's a whole team that's an in-house DreamWorks animation team that's virtually unknown and I feel like each of these studios has some version of that that is just you know there's there's great little secrets out there that you could you could spend a whole career off off the red carpet like that and and not feel like you missed anything yeah I mean especially for like title scene animation uh, some of my favorite sequences yeah. Uh, that I've seen recently uh, come from title scenes and right. uh, the, the the amount of craft that goes into them. Because, I mean, it, it is a, a thing that people will see every episode. Uh, totally. So I guess it makes sense that they're getting a little bit of budget there. Yep. And or when there's special fantasy sequences, sometimes like in certain shows, like maybe on Kung Fu Panda, the series, like there'll be flashbacks where it's suddenly this After Effects multiplane style that's that's the kind of work that goes to this little wrecking crew team, you know, and and that is gorgeous stuff. If you just went to a film festival and just saw that on the screen, you'd be in heaven, you know. That's beautiful work. Um, I just also wanted to ask too if there are any uh, specific early career roles that you think that um, artists might want to take a look at, uh, things they might want to consider uh, as as sort of the early entry points to the industry. Yeah, I think this is a, a tricky one. For, I think for a lot of people, and I guess the better you are as a student, probably the harder it is to get this get this um, notion. <laughs> it, and it's when you're really good, let's say you graduate with like a killer student film or something, and you're really ready to just like kind of set the world on fire. Like there's that that school and that's that's amazing. And I think that's going to be that won't be unnoticed, you know, your level of, of talent and how developed you are at that age. But but there's also this idea of, okay, well, now it's a studio and now you're working to someone else's vision. And now there's there's executives giving notes and there's a showrunner and there's a schedule and a budget and retakes. And, and a, you know, there you, now there's another world to understand and learn. And um, there's it's a it's another whole learning process, you know, where it's like as, as amazing as you can be as a student and as ready as you can be there's a whole other level of learning that starts when in that first job. So my, my feeling is always like people should really have that humbleness, you know, to, to appreciate that and, and to kind of come in. And a lot of us, you know, should start at an entry level, like whether, whether it's, you know, in a, as a production assistant or, you know, a storyboard revisionist or um, a prop revisionist, a lot, a lot of great people have started in, in, in paths like that and have proven what they can do, gotten their confidence and built, built themselves up. So my advice on that, yeah, is to basically appreciate that there's a hierarchy in, in a studio and that there's an entry level position for a reason. And you do learn things in those positions. Mm -hmm. uh, as you say, like you sort of have to understand how production works. And mm -hmm. a great way to do that is uh, through uh, an entry level position like storyboard revisionist, um, mm -hmm. which in a lot of ways is really close in responsibilities and the areas of production it touches to like a director's role. Oh yeah, more more than ever, especially since storyboards and timing have combined, you know, like in in ways that weren't the case, like where you weren't literally working with track and then exporting as a quick time movie for your storyboard. You know, it's, it's really incredible. Yeah. So uh, speaking of skills, a, a significant portion of your book is dedicated to developing soft skills, like writing mm -hmm. a cover letter, interviewing, accepting feedback, all, all these things that are not directly related to uh, animating or storyboarding or making the thing directly. So why are these skills so important and how can people develop them? Gosh, you know, it's it's tough. And, you know, I think someone once teased me when they read the book, said, oh, you want people to just be nicer people or better people or, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I hope I guess that's not a crazy thing. Right. Shouldn't we be better people, nicer people? But um, but, but in a sense, what it's really trying to put the spotlight on in, in chapters like that in the book is the idea of like, if you just take feedback, for instance, there's this, it's just like the mentor conversation we had a moment ago, like that officialness, hmm. you know, people want an official mentor or they think of it as this solid role. 
but um, it doesn't have to be like that. And the same thing happens with feedback. Feedback comes to us so many ways. Feedback comes to us from the neighbor at the Centique across from us who's at the same level or even a junior to us or whatever. And they heard something and they heard that someone noticed we were late and, and are passing that along. And now, but we don't want to hear it because the boss should tell me or, you know, whatever the feedback is, whatever that little nugget of someone trying to pass a message to you, you could want it to be a specific way. You should, you know, you might want to hear it in person from the person themselves in a room with the door closed. You know, you could have all kinds of rules how that should be, but it doesn't, you know, but the real feedback comes to us in so many ways that it's important to, to, uh, know that those messages could be just as important, you know, even if they're not coming to us the way we want them to. So I've, I found that creatively um, is, can impact your success, but it also can impact your, your, you know, as a worker, like, you know, that, that could be true on a construction site as well as at an animation studio, you know, feedback like that. Are there chapters of your career in animation that tend to get a very strong response from artists? Uh, I think the pitching one is always interesting to, to folks because it's so um, clouded in mystery. Um, it, not not the way it was at one point, but now there's all, there's so many great creators that have been really open about their process and have written books. You know, Joe Murray has a book or two about you know, being a successful show creator. And um, you can really hear it from the horse's mouth on YouTube. And there's a lot of people have done, you know, Comic-Con panels and talked about their creation and their process. But but there is still this mystery to it. So I think that one, you know, had a lot of myths to, to dispel, you know, just the idea of what, you know, what you need to have, you know, like how, how far should you take a, a pitch Bible or when, you know, what should you expect, you know, from that first pitch meeting? You know, like I, I feel like there was so much bad information out there that it was it was just nice to kind of try to clear up some of some of that chaos. Yeah, and nobody has a sure thing of how to pitch and get your thing made because <laughs> most of what anyone pitches uh, results in rejection of of some flavor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and yeah, there's you know the things that are really meaningful to me is like stories like Mo Willems who climbed the animation ladder, you know, as a you know from he made Sesame Shorts and then he had a Nick series called The Offbeats, which was like a part of Kablam. And then they gave him a Valentine special that was a half hour. And then he got his Cartoon Network series, uh, Sheep in the Big City, that went two seasons. And then and then he it, it kind of he and he was head writer of Kids Next Door after that. But but I think he kind of felt like, well, this isn't really for me. You know, he wasn't really feeling like animation was delivering what he could do best or show who he was as, a, as an artist or a creator. And, and he ended up a, an incredible children's book author. And a lot of his children's books have become animation, you know, now. Um, he just has a new HBO special, I believe, uh, A Naked Mole Rat is, is his latest project. But his success story, um, you know, shows that even when, when you achieve necessarily what you've been aiming for, you know, is not necessarily the end of the road. You know, I find it really inspirational. Yeah, I, I think that uh, there are a lot of people who wind up on, you know, the dream production and then they wonder, OK, so what next? Yeah, it's true. And, you know, Tom Warburton, who you know worked with uh, Mo on Big Sheep, Sheep in the Big City and then Kids Codename Kids Next Door, he, he used to kid that like there's no like hot tub where you kick your feet up you know, after having a show for six seasons, like Kids Next Door and just like, well, we did it and, and you know, keep it coming. Is my, where's my next show? You know, that's not the reality, you know, most often. And he, he, for one, you know, came to LA after that and built himself up and did, was a retakes director for a while on, on some shows and, and kind of worked his way back up to showrunner on Muppet Babies because that, that is, he's got a great vision and a great, uh, great voice you know we we it's a point of view that you know should be show running and um so I, I love like his story arc is really fascinating too yeah so we've established that there is a lot of work that goes into uh <laughs> careers in the animation industry uh there's never really a point where you can just sort of kick back and expect things uh, to sort of come to you uh th th there's just a constant hustle so in your opinion why do people do it? What's rewarding about working in the animation industry? Oh, man. Um, I'm going to go back again to my first employer, Michael Sporn, who said animation had the the potential to be the greatest art form. And I really agree with him because it's 
a time-based medium, it's art, it's color, it's movement, it's acting, it's sound, it's lighting. And, you know, um, you know, there's just so much in that, you know, that, and you it's all from nothing. You know, there, there's no camera to set up and, and frame your shot on location. There's nothing until you, you know, pick up that Cintiq, you know, pencil or a stylus and, or pad and pencil and, and start making some, some, you know, making some marks. So it's, it's intoxicating in that level. And I don't want to call it like a God complex, but there's a, there's a unique a aspect to it that of, of kind of doing the impossible. And, and for me, like the most significant part, like I, I can explain why I'm, why I do what I do. I, I just love being able to connect with other people. And it's really an odd thing because animators are behind they're, they're not in front of the camera like an actor or performer who wants to kind of do that with their body. Like we're, we're doing that, you know, without, you know, they're taking that risk of stepping onto the stage directly, but we're putting our soul, you know, frame by frame on the screen and instead. And, and uh, I had, you know, this instance when, when my mom passed away and, and uh, I was feeling awful and I, I had like a rare 10 days before my next project, the next job. And I, I just wanted to do something with that time. And instead of just sitting there feeling sad, and I just, I found I, my friend Bob Shard had written this beautiful bouncy children's song. It was a minute long. I just started animating it and I didn't, I was doing it like straight ahead. I wasn't planning it. I didn't storyboard it, didn't storyboard it, didn't um, figure out how to go from shot to shot. I just made it in like the stream of consciousness. And when I was done, I just kind of played it. And I was like, oh, my God, it's a song about parenting and, and a child and a parent. And, and it was like cathartic. And I didn't even understand it. But I knew I had to do it. And, and I had this outlet, you know, as an as a animator, as a filmmaker, a creator. Like, I had this outlet to do it. And that became the film that put me on the map, you know, in film festivals. Nick Jr. showed it as a morning film, you know, for, for a decade. And, and it, it really opened the door to me in terms of understanding, like, wow, so... If I listen to the voice of something I need to express when I make something for me, that's going to be way more powerful than a trend like I'm chasing or a style that someone's doing on Cartoon Network or, or anything else. So that's a unique thing in the in our hands, and and the fact that we can make that film in our living rooms right now, you know, on our iPad Pros or whatever we're we're drawing on, is is a incredible. You know, it's an incredible time to be in this industry. Yeah, I mean, uh, nowadays you don't need to get like a giant uh, SGI terminal and uh, have it scan in a thing and take like this giant, uh, it, it, being able to do everything on a desktop computer makes things a lot easier. Um, yeah. We have about 20 minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to start going through audience questions. Cool. And if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question about careers in animation, but didn't have anyone to ask, we have David Levy on the show right now. Uh, so uh, we'll be looking through uh, the chat on both YouTube and Discord, um, or YouTube and Twitch to see uh, where uh, some questions are coming from. Love it. And while we wait for questions to come in, David, uh, what would you say is the biggest misconception that you've encountered about the animation industry? So, since um, sometimes the view from the outside might not match the experience of artists who are working there. Yeah, and you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, and. Um... We were mentioning a video, a famous one, like uh, that, that a person posted on YouTube. Why I quit my job at Disney? Um, you know, so you can you can look up what frustration points are of people who have felt that way, and I think the the ones that I've seen where where people kind of move on, especially after just trying animation for a few years, is they had a very specific notion of what was supposed to happen and by when, like, you know, where you, you have a certain clock in your head of like, well, I'm 25 now. I, I really wanted to have my own show by 25 or, you know, like there's a certain expectation or to be the supervisor at that age or, you know, like I think when, when we put milestones like that based on our time in the, in the career or our time on a particular production, um, it's kind of hard sometimes to, uh, you know, for the universe to meet meet us, you know, on that demand, um, and and it it kind of it's basically assigning the power to the outs to someone that's not yourself, you know. So I, I really would encourage people instead to that self development is the thing. You know, it's it's not about what what they need to notice about you or what they're missing or what you can do if only they give you a try. You know, like yeah, like you know, in a fair world or with great bosses and a perfect collaborative atmosphere that'll happen. And it, 
it ought to. But um, my 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 feeling has always been use your time outside the job to get to where you want to go. Like, you know, so when I was at Nickelodeon on Blue's Clues and I was storyboarding, I wasn't animating there and I missed animating. So I made a little film. And when I finished the film, I showed it to the director at Blue's Clues and, and he said, wow, you should be animating for us. Why are you storyboarding? And I said, well, that's the job you had open when I applied. And he said, well, maybe you want to switch. And, you know, and I did switch and I became a director a couple of years after that. And it really changed my my career. Um, and it was because I, I went I went home and I did the hard part, right? I I, I worked again. You know, you you're we're all tired at six. It's you know at six o'clock, whatever you stop. You don't want to go home and start your next shift. But you know, I really felt like I needed to. You know, I felt I, I had something to say. But I, more importantly, I felt I had I had improvement that I needed to. I, I needed to invest in my own improvement and to see where I could go. And and I didn't believe that that was. Nickelodeon's responsibility. I thought it was mine. Yeah, I also think too that there is something to um, th those like why I quit uh, yeah. the studio videos. Um, if you do hear a lot of things about a studio and it draws you in and you get there and you find that the experience that you had in your head is not the experience that you get there and you don't want to continue working there you did absolutely quit because um, <laughs> it doesn't sound like it would be a place that you'd want to work long term. Totally agree. Uh, so, yeah. so I, I, I totally get why um, both, both your point of view as to like your, your career is your responsibility and also the other point of view of, you know, that this wasn't really what I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that conversation is only a, a positive thing, really. Me too. Um, yeah. So I want to get to some of the viewer questions. Uh, one of the viewer questions is about networking. So um, what kinds of networking events are out there and what do you think is an effective way to network for someone who's trying to get into the industry? I think uh, I've, I've enjoyed going to hear speakers and panels, whether it's like a film festival or a Comic-Con. And the fun thing is like, let's say you want them to sign, you know, your book or some video or, you know, whatever you brought with you to, for them to sign a sketchbook when you're in that line you know at the end of the lecture like the people that are also in the line with you are really cool to meet too you know i feel like we forget that and some people organically start talking to everybody i get it but a lot of people like have this tunnel vision of that's gandhi tartakovsky or like whoever is like going to be at that panel going to sign in two minutes and grab their sharpie like that's it's this tunnel vision but like everyone on that line with you is just as excited in this moment as you are and those are like future collaborators, peers, you know, people with like the same interests as you. Um, it's it's really great to, you know, appreciate those, you know, people too. And I've seen people, I, I once saw someone cut in front of me at one of those things. And and I, I was at a, a festival in the West Coast and I was in New York, New York at, at the time. They cut me, cut me in line and I looked at them, oh, this person, right? And you remember who did that. And then when I got back to New York, I saw that person at, at an ASIFA event. Oh, they're a New Yorker. So, you know, and like now I have this idea about this person as the one who cut me in line because they, you know, I was just someone to maneuver around you know they, they weren't they weren't even thinking about me you know so <laughs> i'm not saying hold long long pointless grudges but um I, I do think you know appreciate where you are and that there's all these people that are that are just as excited as you that are fun to meet too and and um take the pressure off you know find give yourself the goal especially if you're really you know feeling like it's your first time and it's it's awkward to start conversations um you know make a goal of like, well, this afternoon at the first day of, of, you know, CTN Expo, whatever, I'm going to try to talk to two people, you know, like you, you can give yourself like the smallest goals and, and that's two people over five hours. You can do it. You know? So I think, you know, start in whatever that comfort zone is for you. And then maybe you'll, you'll grow that out, you know, as you go or organically, when you start talking to those two people, their friends come over and then before you know it, you're in a group and you found your tribe, you know? So I, I love, Love those events. I love CTN Expo. Um, I haven't been been to all the festivals, you know, that there are. There's like Lightbox, and um, I, I'm going to be doing more of that. I'm going to Kid Screen in Miami, you know, through Invisible Universe in July. So um, it's networking to me is not something you do at the beginning of a career to set things in motion. It's something you you know you make time for your whole career because it's 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 connecting to other people that care about what you like, and and making future collaborator connections and and uh you know just kind of it's it's really an exciting fun thing to do 
Yeah, I mean, the kid screen is great. Lightbox Expo is great. Uh, I know that uh, the Ottawa International Animation Festival, oh, love it. Uh, just uh, Annecy, uh, which just finished. Mm -hmm. um, th th there are a ton of events around the world, and yeah. you can probably find one near you. Yeah, and Pixel Auto is actually one of my favorite, which is in uh, Mexico. Mm. They're just fantastic there. Shout out to Jose Anesta and the Pixel Auto crew. Uh, we have some more questions. Uh, one question is, uh, do you advice for someone who wants to enter the animation industry at an older age? Um, there are people who are already working in creative industries, but maybe want to make the switch to animation when they're 30 plus. And if you think that you are older, if you're 30 plus, you are not <laughs> older. No, it's you're still old. young. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, there's no, you know, one way to do it. You know, I would, I love, I love that about animation, especially when we're talking about Take, take a try, you know, if you're interested in the animation industry and you haven't really dabbled yet, like, and you're working in some other way in another industry related or other on or not, you can, you know, create a, a Instagram page or, you know, post, post some animation tests or little self-contained content bits and, and just start, you know, seeing, do you have the aptitude for animation? Do you have the interest, the vision, the desire to wake up the next morning and make the next one? You know, I think those are really important markers of, you know, should I, at whatever age, you know, enter enter a different field? Um, and I, I, I recommend that to students too. You know, I, it's still kind of shocking when I, I meet students that didn't make films on their own before they went to art school for animation. Even flip, like flip, you have to, must have at least made flip books or something, right? Like you wouldn't, you know, go to like a auto mechanic, you know, school if you'd never been under a car before like why would you have chosen that you know you needed to have a wrench in your hand and get under the car and start you know figuring it out like that should be a passion that you're not waiting on um and it also can can teach you a lot it might teach you whoa i have no patience for this i don't want to do this it looked really exciting and it isn't once i tried it i don't want it like that's great to know too all right one last question from the audience um yeah. how do you find peers in animation. So uh, the, the question was like most of the time, uh, indie animators that they know start solo, learning animation, yeah. animation software are basics, really solo pursuit. Uh, how, how do you find peers and cohorts that can uh, you can learn from? Yeah, I th that's a great question. And my it's kind of a guiding light for me on, on this question. When, when students are asking like, where should I work? Or, you know, what kind of job should I, what, what's the definition of a good first job? I, I think it's anywhere where you can learn, where there's people that can teach you something. Because um, I've heard of opportunities, people have oddball opportunities as their first job sometimes. Like I remember as a teacher at SVA, a student coming in saying, oh, I got this gig and I'm doing an animated short for a chiropractor who hired me and I'm putting a team together and we're animating this, this local commercial for this chiropractor. And that's awesome, right? There's nothing wrong with that. And then the more you hear about it, the more you realize, oh, yeah, this chiropractor is just giving random notes. They don't know what they're doing. Like, it's this crazy, chaotic gig. And, you know, it's and like when I think of the amount of effort, like once that's done, that went into making that for this chiropractor who has no understanding of the industry, you, you look at that opportunity as, oh, you know, if, if you had instead worked for a great you know, studio under a great mentor on, on a single commercial or anything you know, like that, like what you would have gained would have been, you know, hugely, you know, better than that scenario. So I, I feel like, you know, be be where you can learn, be where you can be pushed um, to learn and develop and, and grow, you know, vers versus like some odd fit like like that. David, where can your viewers go to learn more about your book, find more of your work, and learn about what you're doing at Invisible Universe? Uh, cool. Well, you can you can check us out, you know, at invisibleuniverse.com, um, I believe, you know, online, and um, learn more about our, our roster of characters. So that would be fun. And you could follow follow us, uh, our characters like Quay Quay and Squeaky and Roy and, and Clydeo on, on Instagram and TikTok, and our our Ember little devil girl Ember character. Um, you can also find um, my personal work. I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to keep my hands in, in uh, personal creative creative endeavors always. And, and one of the ways I'm doing it now is I have an account on Instagram called Dave the Dad Jokes, where I, I use my, my life as a father of a six-year-old um, and then all the scenarios that come up in our house day to day from that. And 
I draw I draw those little moments. So they're not really dad jokes like yuck 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 dad jokes, you know, or can be, but they're little slice slice of life, you know, dad moments, um, you know, from my point of view, and and it's really fun to have that outlet. And and when I look back on it, it's making me remember little things that I would have forgot, you know, over the last six years. So I I love that as creators we can we can freeze time, we can kind of document you know our lives in so many ways and and that's that's how i'm doing it on that on that page yeah i mean i i know that we had you here to discuss careers but i also really love hearing about the sort of personal side of animation and the craft and what it really means to you because i think that's what sustains people in this industry yeah. absolutely yeah and you know. uh most importantly where can people find your book Oh, thanks, thanks, Mike, for that question. Um, it's it's available. I know it's at Barnes and Noble, and but certainly Amazon is a great place to pick it up. Um, that's where I would buy it. Whenever I have to pick it up for someone else, I go there. <laughs> All right, uh, David, thank you so much for joining our uh, live stream, and I'd also like to thank our audience for joining in today's discussion. If you enjoyed today's interview, this upcoming Tuesday. We'll be hosting another interview with animation instructor Tony Ross, which you won't want to miss. We'll be discussing the work that Tony and his creative team put into a new set of tutorials for learning Harmony Premium. You can find more details about the project right now at tuneboom.com. And if you missed the Animation Trends event, we now have a recap of that on the blog, which you can find at blog.tuneboom.com. Relevant to today's discussion, we had two panels about careers in animation, one featuring animators working in the industry and the other featuring recruiters. Uh, so if you're looking for uh, all kinds of perspectives on the uh, animation career journey, uh, I really recommend taking a look at those panels after this one. So thank you so much for watching and be sure to tune in next time. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Toon Boom. <laughs>